the island of Maui, Hawaii. A lush tropical island of rainforests. Pineapple plantations. Volcanoes. W.S. Merwin moved to Maui in 1979. A Pulitzer winner and author of two dozen books, Merwin is recognized as one of the most distinguished poets of our time. For four decades, Merwin has written about man's alienation from nature. His recent poems often voice fierce complaints about the destruction of the environment and the loss of the native culture of Hawaii. I mean, it seems to me that the Hawaiians tell us that that's a sacred island. It is, uh, according to the Hawaiians, it is one of the manifestations of the god Kanaloa, who was the god of the sea, god of death, and was originally probably the oldest creation figure in the Pacific. And uh, it's not a symbol of Kanaloa, it is one of the presences of Kanaloa. That island is Kanaloa. When he woke, his mind was the West, and he could not remember waking. Wherever he looked, the sun was coming toward him, the moon was coming toward him. Month after month, the wind was coming toward him. Behind the day, the night was coming toward him. All the stars, all the comets, all the depths of the sea, all the darkness in the earth, all the silence, all the cold, all the heights were coming toward him. No one had been on the earth before him. All the stories were coming toward him over the mountain, over the red water, the black water, the moonlight. He had imagined the first mistake. All the humans are coming toward him with numbers. They're coming from the beginning. Princeton, New Jersey. Here, ivy-covered halls house one of the world's great universities. Joyce Carol Oates, the author of three dozen acclaimed works of fiction and nonfiction, came to Princeton in 1978 to teach at the university. And I did my dissertation on Charles Oates Church. lives with her husband, Ray Smith, in an affluent neighborhood five miles out of town. Her novel, American Appetites, is set in a similar community of successful academics and intellectuals. There are two or three men who think they are the model for the protagonist. <laughs> One jokes about suing me, but I don't think he's going to really do that because there really isn't any model. I mean, I myself am as much of a model for the main character, and it's set in our house. The novel set in this house, which has a lot of glass in it. I sort of put things together. I think most novelists are like magpies or crows, taking bits of details and ingredients from real life and, and weaving them all together into a kind of fanciful nest. And people look in the nest and say, well, here's an old ribbon. That was my ribbon. Or here's an old pipe cleaner or something. But really, it's a complete gestalt and in a sense doesn't bear any relationship to those same things outside the context. the Blue Ridge Mountains, Southern Virginia. In 1987, writer T.R. Pearson bought 40 acres of land here, then had his house built atop the hill. Acclaimed by critics as a striking new voice in the tradition of Faulkner and Twain, Pearson begins his day's work each weekday morning at dawn. T.R. Pearson is the author of four comic novels of the South, a short history of a small place about an eccentric suicide, off for the sweet hereafter about a pair of convenience store robbers, the last of how it was a family history, and call and response about love and marriage in a small town. 
I think I'm trying to illustrate my vision of the South, of the part of the South that I write about, within the, the various limitations of prose fiction. I'm trying to play off the conventions of the novel, for instance, off of The Sweet Hereafter is a kind of romance that goes badly wrong. And, and uh, uh, I had the opportunity there to put two characters together with Jane Elizabeth Firesheets and Benton Lynch, who, who had a who, who had a, a relationship together in which uh, they were full of well aware, and I was trying to indicate all of the physical properties at play when people throw themselves together in you know in love or romance. It's not like television, and it's not like the movies. And uh, when they're rolling around in the all together in the hay, they tend every now and then to, to bump accidentally together, and things don't work right. And uh, uh, life for them was is awkward and their relations together are awkward and that's the way I find things usually because I know how my life is and, and nothing works out like in uh, uh, light fiction and movies. Uh, everything is a little different somehow. They rolled around in the hay some and grappled some like they'd rolled around and grappled on the wood planking and then Jane Elizabeth Firesheets took the liberty of separating Ben Lynch from his trousers and from cotton briefs or anyway she'd commenced to take the liberty of separating Ben Lynch from his trousers and his briefs when she discovered she had to separate him as well from his Harrington and Richardson Buntline revolver of extraordinarily high caliber, which she'd taken for something long and steely from the outset, but not a gun exactly. And she held it and looked at it and cocked it and uncocked it and pointed it and ran her tongue out her mouth and back in her mouth again and said, ooh, in a tone Benton Lynch had never heard used on a revolver before. the Upper West Side, New York City. It has been said that for a writer living in New York, the subject is everywhere. When Trey Ellis began his first novel, he set the book in Manhattan, where he has lived since 1978 in a Riverside Drive apartment that once belonged to his father. Platitudes is an experimental novel that incorporates elements such as menus, lists, computer printouts, and test questions. It is a story within a story about a 38-year-old writer named Duane and about the teenage protagonist Duane is writing about, Earl. Earl lifts a toast point. Platitudes is also about stereotypes and cliches. When the novel was published in 1988, one critic described it as a wickedly funny antidote to such classics of the black experience as the color purple. As a kid, I love that stuff. I think that's why I think this, the parody works, um, because I don't despise it. So I'm, I'm a little sympathetic to it. Um, I mean, I loved Sounder as a kid. I would read all of you know, Maya Angelou and, and, and his different works. But then as I got a little older and I read sort of second and now 10th generation um, Afro-Baroque glory stories, as, as uh, Dwayne calls them, I just can't stand him anymore. And I think that we have so many, um, the black experience is so broad now that it's, it's, it's pandering for a lot of urban, upper middle class black writers to write pretending that they are from, uh, that they were born barefoot in a shack. Section three, reading comprehension. Example. Most people do not know the interesting origins of Nabisco's Oreo cookie, one of the world's most eaten dessert snack biscuits. If people realized that it was invented by a wealthy Afro-American baker and leader of the pro-assimilation movement of the 1940s, they might think twice before unscrewing the chocolate wafers and eating the cream filling separately. The author probably believes that A, Whitey is the devil, B, today is the first day of the rest of your life. C, the already troubled black bourgeoisie is now in danger of assimilating itself to smithereens. Or D, the best things in life are free. Mi bucko, the best things in life are free. The correct answer is a matter of heated debate.
the Hudson River Valley, New York State. Writer T. Carragason Boyle was born and raised here in northern Westchester, just across the river from Tarrytown, where Washington Irving created his legends. Boyle now lives in Los Angeles, but he returned to this landscape of his youth for the setting of his third novel. World's End follows the intertwined fates of three families in the Hudson River Valley, from the Dutch settlers of the 17th century to the youth movement of 1968. I think maybe uh, 20 years ago, uh, literature became so hermetic so much a product of the Academy that uh, we began to lose our audience. And I like to consider myself, or remind myself when I'm writing, that the bottom line is that this is an entertainment. Literature is enjoyable, it's fun. Everything else is secondary. That was the way out to Greasy Lake. The Indians had called it Wakan, a reference to the clarity of its waters. Now it was fetid and murky the mud banks glittering with broken glass and strewn with beer cans and the charred remains of bonfires. It was a single ravaged island a hundred yards from shore, so stripped of vegetation it looked as if the Air Force had strafed it. We went up to the lake because everyone went there, because we wanted to snuff the rich scent of possibility on the breeze, watch a girl take off her clothes and plunge into the festering murk, drink beer, smoke pot, howl at the stars, savor the incongruous, full-throated roar of rock and roll against the primeval susurrus of frogs and crickets. This was nature. Chicago, crossroads of America. Poet Lee Young Lee lives here on the north side of town in this three-family house. Give me another plate. Do you have a plate? Lee lives with his wife and two sons. He shares the house with the families of his older sister and brother. I'm not, no, I'm okay. Hey, you guys better be careful. I used a different curve. This is hot. This is a resting place in an extraordinary family odyssey. Lee Young Lee was born in Jakarta, Indonesia in 1957. His parents were Chinese aristocrats. When the last emperor was ousted at the turn of the century, Lee's great-grandfather on his mother's side became the first president of the People's Republic of China. As a young man, Lee's father was personal physician to Mao Zedong. In 1951, he left China to found a medical school in Indonesia. When Sukarno came to power seven years later, Lee's father was seized as a political prisoner. He was detained for 19 months, including a stay in a leper colony. In 1959, the family escaped. For five years, they wandered in exile from country to country. They finally settled in Pennsylvania, where Lee's father studied theology and became a Presbyterian minister. The poems in Lee Young Lee's first book, Rose, are about family history and the poet's relationship with his father. The centerpiece of the collection is called Always a Rose. About a year before I wrote the first line, I thought to myself, enough fooling around. I want to be entirely spent on one project, on one poem. It would have to be long. It would have to be spiritually and emotionally taxing. I would have to bring the entire weight of my being onto this poem. At that point, I had no use for any other kind of, of poem that I was writing, so I, I wanted to be spent. So maybe that accounts for some of the, uh, the obsessive quality in the poem. I came and found a rose, left for dead, heaped with the hopeless dead, its petals still supple. Of my brother's one would have ignored it, another ravished it, the third would have pinned it to his chest and swaggered home. My sister would rival its beauty, my mother bow before it, then bear it to my father's grave, where he would grant it seven days, then return and claim it forever. I took it, put it in water, and set it on my windowsill.
the Lower East Side, New York City. For 30 years, Allen Ginsberg has lived here, among the bodegas and the street people, the artists and the immigrants. In a cluttered low-rent apartment, Ginsberg struggles with the rambling lines of Whitman, the plain speech of William Carlos Williams, and the surreal imagery of Blake to create his own unique poem of America. In the 1950s, Allen Ginsberg was one of a circle of writers known as The Beats, intellectual hipsters of the bebop era. Writers such as Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, Gregory Corso, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. With their experiments in language and lifestyle, Ginsberg and these original beat writers influenced an American generation. With the publication of his collected poems in 1985 and his sequel to Kaddish, White Shroud, Ginsberg remains a vital force in American letters. His most famous poem is Howl, a counterculture manifesto Ginsberg wrote in San Francisco in 1955. But his masterpiece came later, Kaddish, about his insane mother Naomi, who died in 1956. Behind that also, there's a still unresolved a certain guilt at having not been able to take care of her properly when she was alive, and having, in fact, uh, been the one to have to sign the papers for a lobotomy uh, after the doctors at uh, Pilgrim State Hospitals warned me that she would have a stroke and perhaps um, perish unless something were done to cut the emotional torrent. The section, Oh Mother, What Have I Forgotten, that was done in Paris. And then, then I, when I got home to New York, I realized I haven't written my mother's story, and I might as well write it. But I was thinking of it as a story rather than a poem, but then it came out so intense that it was a 25, 30-page narrative poem, sort of like Rambo's prose poems. Oh, mother, what have I left out? Oh, mother, what have I forgotten? Oh, mother, farewell with a long black shoe. Farewell with Communist Party in a broken stocking. Farewell with six dark hairs on the wind of your breast. I draw upon people who have tried to do things in this country and in the world, from Martin to Malcolm to Lumumba to John Brown. Wear the New Day Well, a profile of poet Sonia Sanchez. We are here because of the children of Atlanta. Language, politics, and African American history. The detention of young brothers and sisters in South Africa. Listen to their cries, my brothers and sisters. Ah! Sonia Sanchez, a childhood of hardship in Alabama, three decades of struggle in Harlem, a tenured professor and award winning poet in Philadelphia, witness to the Move tragedy of 1985. This is part of our history. You know, and it must be recorded in some fashion. Not just the report, but also the poetry that records something that is terrible. Hurry on down to Ulse Street. They're roasting in the fire. Smell the dreadlocks and black skins roasting in the fire.